Congratulations on getting Linux systems set up on your computer. But now we have to deal with this factor. How do we manage Linux on that computer? How do we keep it running? What are the factors involved? Well, today we wanna to have a look at all of these various ideas and just whet the appetite so you can get an understanding of where to start doing your research because there is no one model fits all. Hey, even on Windows, there's no one bottle fits all. So, hey, we're in good company with that. So stay tuned. We're going to talk about how to manage a Linux system that you already have built. So thanks for checking out this video. And hopefully we will give you some really good strategies by which you can be managing your Linux systems. So managing Linux is going to involve your software changes, kernel updates, package updates, system backups, things like this. These are the types of things that are gonna go into it. Now, since Linux has many varieties, there's no one good thing that works for everything. That's why you don't find a simple, concise guide. But here we're gonna give you the best we can do. We're gonna give you some tips and some tricks. And we're gonna describe some general ideas to keep a Linux system stable, and maybe even a little bit about what to do when it becomes unstable. I've talked about those in the past, so maybe we'll defer to those. Stick around till the end and I'll give you my take on what the easiest to maintain Linux system happens to be. All right, the first thing we wanna talk about in managing your Linux system is the drivers. Now, the way the Linux kernel is put together, the vast majority of the drivers are inside of the kernel itself. So for the vastest majority of your hardware, and we're talking your basic hardware, your, your keyboards and your mice, generally a graphics card, generally a wireless card, networking cards, things like this, these are all included in the kernel. And so you generally you don't have to do anything to get those to work. But there are a few interesting philosophies in Linux. Some of those drivers are not free and open source. And because of that, you will find some distributions that will not install those drivers out of the box. And so you might have to do some differential finagling. So other equipment, you can find the drivers online. Example, Brother Printers. You can download Linux versions of Brother Printers in either DEB or RPM ver uh, package formats, and you can install them directly for your device if you happen to buy a printer and it doesn't work out of the box. Even those though, many of those do work out of the box these days because the kernel is getting better and better. And as long as drivers are open source, kernel developers are packaging those drivers in. Now, where you will run into a few issues is if you have a very, very new hardware and, and a Linux distribution has a much older kernel. Something in the old five range will not work on newer hardware as well as a six range. And so installing a latest version of a kernel is usually your best fix for some of those issues. Now, what type of stuff might you have issues with? NVIDIA cards have typically been problematic, although there has been a lot of positive movement lately as they have open sourced some of their drivers. Broadcom chips um, and a few other wireless chips in the past have had problems. And some of your absolute latest processors or motherboards, but again, some of these are fixed in the latest kernel developments. The issue with drivers is usually the free and open source element. So at the free and open source element, Distributions like Fedora and Debian don't like shipping things that are not entirely free, whereas an Ubuntu or, um, I don't know, I guess Arch also go, follows with that, but there's more pathways to have the non-free versions. Ubuntu, they don't care as much. They just want a usable Linux system, and this is why Ubuntu is so popular for a lot of downstream distributions. If you absolutely want only totally 100% free and open source systems, you may, will have to deal with some compromises. But for the most part, these are solved. Now the latest version of Debian, this actually solves a lot of this issue in that on the install you can choose the only free drivers or you can choose the proprietary drivers without also opening yourself up to proprietary software. And so Debian has made a lot of very positive progress in the last version with that. Ubuntu itself has a driver manager, so when you install it, if there's some proprietary driver that it didn't install, you can click that button, it'll search your system and tell you about it and install it. 
So there are options on these. And um, ultimately, the issue more often than not is resolved by installing a newer kernel. Now, what happens if you run a system update, you update the, the kernel and you cannot boot in? Well, Linux systems usually keeps at least two kernels there. The current one you just had when you upgraded and the new one you're upgrading to. And when you install a new Linux kernel, it defaults to install uh, load the new one. Well, if you have problems, the best thing to do is get into that boot menu when your computer first starts up, go down to to the advanced properties and boot in older version of the kernel. If that solves your problem, the issue is the kernel you just installed. So there's either a bug with it or you need to skip the, the current one and just pay closer attention to how the testing is going. But as far as drivers, mostly the Linux kernel is going to solve a lot of these issues. So the next part in managing Linux is the directory structure. It's important that you understand how your directory structure is set up. Almost every Linux distribution, unless you do something specifically weird or unusual, everything is easily contained within slash home and then slash your username. So if you're if your uh, distribution is uh, your your user account is Tom, then it's slash home slash Tom. Inside of that is everything. Inside of this contains all of your personal files, your photos, your music, your movies, your documents, all these different items. It also contains all of your system specific settings, your desktop environment settings, and application settings. All of this is stored by default inside of that home directory. And this is important to understand because if you happen to want to make a copy of everything and retain your software preferences, all you need to do is copy everything within that folder. Now, if you just boot it up, you might only see the basics, the, the desktop, the uh, downloads, movies, music, pictures, uh, templates you'll probably see in there. And with that, you may not see everything. Well, you need to show all files to see everything. So many desktop environments, it's uh, control H and plasma. It's, I think it's alt dot, I think we'll show it that. Those are the default ones. That'll show you all the things. So you'll see a dot config, you'll see a dot cache, and then you'll see a dot with the application name for several different applications that you may have adjusted the settings. If you save those folders, the dot config and the dot application name folders, you will be able to port those files back onto the new Linux distribution and all of the settings you have changed for those applications will also be imported as well. And that is important because this tells you what you need to back up in order to save all of your information. And I recommend that you do a good solid backup before you do an upgrade on your system. In case there's any problems, you will be able to recover, if nothing else, your files. And hey, installing Linux is easy. As long as you have a copy of your files, that's fine. That being said, you might want to keep some system restore points and things like that. We're going to talk about that in a whole separate part down the road. But there are many backup applications that can be set to include or exclude various files, file sizes. You can save or not save those configurations. Some people say, well, all, as long as I have my pictures, I'm good. And so you might do a backup of that, but you don't really care about your system settings. All these are factors that you keep in mind. And so just understanding that directory structure is what gives you the information you need in order to manage that element. Once you have that, all taken care of, you can have confidence if your system breaks, at least you haven't lost any data. Our next part is software. Now we've done a lot of videos on the channel about software, so we're not going to belabor this one a lot. I'm just going to give you a little bit of introductory points and I'll link a video on more detail on this uh, in the description here. But software can be added, updated, and removed in the terminal or in various GUI software applications. Now, my favorite Linux distribution, Linux Mint, they have a separate software tool for adding and removing software, and they have a separate one for upgrading software. 
The upgrading software can also do Linux kernels and they'll have a variety of things. You can see if something is a security update or if it's a version update or if it's a flat pack update in the newest versions. And you can easily go through, you can easily check or uncheck what you do or don't want in updated. You can run that, you can hold packages back. All that's easily done from the graphic user interface. That's what the GUI stands for since we threw that acronym out. Ubuntu utilizes the Snap Store. This is going to do software updates and in, in uh, installing and removing. Anything with the GNOME desktop environment has the GNOME Software Store, which is the default in your base Fedora and Debian systems. And of course, we have the Synaptic Package Manager, which is a apt-based system, which allows you to just see the software applications, a little bit more information, use easy check boxes for adding and removing things. This is all easy. Pamuk is a good graphical user interface one in Manjaro. Uh, Discover is on Plasma, or is it called Discovery? It's either called Discover or Discovery on Plasma. Uh, these are all software stores. Pop OS and uh, Elementary OS have their own software stores as well. Most distributions have a form of software store, or if they don't have one tied specifically to the distribution, they're going to use like the GNOME software store or something else that is involved or connected to a desktop environment. Now you can also install, update, and remove packages in the terminal. A Debian system, so Debian, Ubuntu, Linux Mints, anything based on that branch generally uses apt. We have anything in the Arch family, Jenny uses Pac-Man. We have DNF, we have EO package. Uh, NixOS is an interesting one. We had a whole video on NixOS, so you can have a look at that. They have a separate package manager that you, I believe you can use with other distributions as well. I haven't not dug into that one. I've just looked at the distribution itself. So software itself, it's fairly easy to add it, to remove it and things. We're not gonna talk any more about that just because we've covered that in a lot of different places. And we wanna talk a little bit more uh, going forward about what to do more about your system, the software you have installed and your personal files. Next, this brings us to restore points. A restore point, of course, if you'd be familiar with this on a Windows system, whereas a restore point is a place where you can go back to a previous known good version of the system. Now, also closely related, we also have backup software. Now, there is a distinction between these two types of software, so if you're utilizing one of these, make sure you know, is it a system that's going to do backup software, like backing up your personal files, or is it going to do a system backup, which are two distinct things. And so with this, make sure whatever software you're using, you have an understanding of uh, what type of software you're dealing with. Rarely you will you find one that does both. So the first of course is time shift. This has become a popular application in the last uh, half a decade or so. This produces effectively the restore points you'd find on a Windows system. Whereas these restore points, it doesn't do anything with your files, but it will restore the operating system around your home directory, around your individual files, so that you can go back to a last known good configuration. Meanwhile, other systems will take the just the personal files, but with the personal files, saved you can just reinstall the operating system there are good backup solutions that can give you both but you'd use separate things so time shift is restore points it does not save personal files by default so you want to keep that in mind now linux mint ubuntu systems they have an application called backup files this will easily allow you to back up all of your personal files including any configuration files and it's also going to give you the ability to save any software that you have installed as well so this is a feature of these also now these are good solutions inside of that if you have some other system and you don't already have backup files or some other backup system in place Pika is a good opportunity that I've done a video looking at Pika before. Pika is a separate application. You can install it as a flat pack or it's available. It's, it's a part of the GNOME software family. So it's available to most distributions. This gives you a separate backup app for personal files and for software and software settings. You can set this up as a local backup or as a remote backup. You can tell it to take a copy of all your files and send it somewhere else. You can specify where they are. And what I like about Pika the most is it allows encrypted backups. So particularly if you are putting it onto 
any other server, a remote server, you definitely want to encrypt those files. Now I did a video where we experimented with that and we were able to take all the personal files, send them up through the cloud, pull them down and re-decrypt them on a separate system. So I'll put the video for that in there. Just be aware when you're talking about software or um, you're talking about your restore points, some software is going to do a system restore point, other software is going to do personal files. It's good to have run both software uh, solutions independently or, or concurrently with each other. So you have your personal files on one hand and your system restore points on the other hand. So that is certainly an option that we can do. Thanks for making it this far in the video. If you've not already subscribed to the channel, please consider doing so today. Go ahead and uh, hit that like button down there and leave us some comments down below. Also, let me know, do you like the Arizona desert backdrop? I thought it'd be a fun video just to get all the information and to get a chance to see the beautiful environment that I get to live in as I travel around the country in my van. This brings us to our bonus content. So with the bonus content, I want to talk about what is the easiest to manage Linux distribution. Now there is, um, there's obviously no perfect distribution out here, uh, but uh, what I want to talk about is which distributions over time have given me the easiest overall use and management with the fewest hiccups. The award has to go to Linux Mint. Not that it has been without its share of issues, but I think every single issue I've had relates to one computer and that computer has a very small hard drive. So it has a very small uh, boot partition, which is fills up with extra Linux kernels. Now that is certainly an, a, um, a problem. So the reason Linux Mint is good is the update processes and the, the system messages does push time shift so it does encourage you to set up time shift and it will warn you if you haven't set it up of course you can click the button to say hey dismiss don't tell me about this again that's perfectly fine it does have restore points in time shift and it also has the backup files applications as well so you have both of those as as options and it generally does not have any real issues other than the fact i've had a few problems that that boot sector has filled up a couple times and i actually think that might be because i had to install extra kernels and i never cleared the old ones out and kernels are getting bigger and that hard drive is small and i think that those are the factors but there is actually uh, a system setting in there that I had subsequently turned on that should hopefully fix that problem but we'll see now I did have a pretty serious issue with that and um, I went uh, I went ahead and linked a, a video to this here put it up there in the cards so you can get a chance to see how I solved that problem and all of the details so there's actually a blog post on the website about it as well but with this, it does have um, it does have the fewest overall problems compared to other systems where I've had that have simply have imploded or we've had other issues kind of get in the way. So that brings us to our video on managing Linux. Let me know the things that I missed in the comments down below. Also give me other ideas that you might have for videos. Of course, this video came because somebody said, hey, can you do a video about managing Linux and uh, issued an, a, uh, a problem there. So of course, have a look at the other videos on the channel to learn more about Linux distributions and things like that. And once again, go ahead and like the video if you've not already done so and leave us some comments down below. Thanks for watching and I hope that you enjoy switching to Linux in the Arizona desert. Thank you for watching this video from Switched to Linux. This channel would not be possible without the backing of the program supporters scrolling on the screen now. You can be a supporter at Patreon at patreon.com slash t-o-m-m or at thinklifemedia.com. I also want to thank the open source community who creates such excellent software that makes producing this show possible please remember to support your software communities. Thank you, and I hope that you enjoy switching to Linux.